Welcome to Authentic Living with Roxanne, a place where we have conscious conversations about things that really matter in our lives. And now, here's your host, Roxanne Derhage. Uh, Roxanne Durhaj for Authentic Living with Roxanne. Thanks for uh, tuning in again. Um, today I have a special guest, uh, Omar and I um, met, it's going to probably be about uh, six months ago where we were privileged to speak on the same stage um, at a Disrupt Ni- uh, Niagara event. Uh, so Omar, thanks for, so much for uh, coming in today to chat with us. Oh, my pleasure. So I'll tell you a little bit about him and we're going to jump right in. And um, he's a, a performance, peak performance uh, coach. And so we're going to talk a lot about his expertise. Um, he has a background in engineering, which is uh, quite fascinating, along with um, uh, education in uh, human resources uh, from both U of T and um, the University of Michigan with uh, 30 years experience in um is it the biotech uh, sector, Omar? Uh, uh, more like telecommunications and high tech. Telecommunication. Yeah. So, um, so thanks for coming in. And we're going to jump right into um, that whole concept of um, what is flow. You hear that? I often my my son's a golfer, and yeah. um, you know he he plays a, as a pretty competitive level, and you'll hear that being talked a lot with. Um, athletes but yeah i'm interested in kind of your perspective about in reference to to individual flow and how that the kind of work that you do uh with individuals and organizations to get to flow but maybe starting with a definition would probably help us sure so at, at the very highest level flow is that state you're in when you feel your best and when you perform your best Okay. So it's a state of optimal experience with spikes of peak performance. Okay. So is this biological? Is it, is it kind of, you know, am I, you know, I, I often think I have, I have one child, but yeah. you know, growing up in a family of six, yeah. um, I, I sort of God that I think, you know, each one of us had individual personalities. So does, yeah. does, does flow have anything to do with personality? Or is it, it's a different kind of concept? Well, flow is, so flow is a very subjective experience. Okay. And uh, what puts you into flow uh, will be based on many kind of individual factors that are unique to you, including your personality. And what will put me into flow is a completely different set of factors. So the description of flow and the experience of flow can be described with, you know, universally, there's very common characteristics but it's a very subjective in the moment experience. So even you with your other family members, you would all have very different experiences of flow. Okay. So when, when we're thinking of flow, then let's say um, someone's coming, uh, whether it's an organization or uh, a CEO or or a manager that's coming to you, what are some of the elements that you walk through with them to understand flow? And, and I know you've done, you've created some actual uh, products or uh, things that you actually use with people. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about that because I've never gone through anything. I've done, uh, you know, the um, occupational fits kind of psychological assessments in the past yeah. where, um, yeah. you know, one of the things that they thought I should be was a chemist. And I, yeah. I thought, you know, I thought, well, I don't think my personality is like that, but <laughs> it was one of those things that came up, but also, um, also executive management was the, one of the other ones. Yeah. So what are some of the, the things or products that you've developed to help people um, assess their flow? Well, so um, I, I guess it goes back to work that was done by the Gallup organization. Uh, it was a project in the uh, mid nineties called the good life project where Gallup looked at uh, something like 80,000 managers around the world to try to understand what differentiates a strong manager from an average manager. And so Gallup developed a survey called StrengthsFinder, which basically gives you your top five talents 
from a list of 34 and Gallup has a very clear definition of talents. And so I typically, I typically work with companies who are using that survey tool strengths finder and now they're, they've kind of tried all the ideas they can think of and they need a little bit more help from, from an expert to go a little deeper. So I start with strengths finder okay. and, and then basically the, the fundamental point that I make is the business case is, is pretty clear now. It's been replicated over and over again in different studies. The, your, your performance, the payoff of your performance is significantly higher if you're practicing your strengths while in the state of flow, significantly higher. So okay. I kind of start there. And productivity, I would obviously that trend, I'm sure the research that you're just referring to is a, is it a quantifiable kind of percentage that they find that when people are in flow versus when they're, they're out of flow in reference to the bottom line, in reference to like, uh, you know, numbers. So, and again, I think the, the reason I'm so interested in this field now is I've been pursuing this line of inquiry for about 25 years, but more and more numbers are starting to come out now. And McKinsey, and anyone's welcome to email me if they want any of this reference material. McKinsey uh, wrote an article where they were actually uh, working with this idea of flow with business executives. And they asked 5,000 executives over the course of a decade, uh, in your view, when you're, you and your team are in flow, how much more productive are you? Mm -hmm. And the uh, most frequent answer is 500%. So <laughs> when, wow. when, you, when you're in a team, and, and this kind of step function in performance has been replicated over and over again. We're not talking about doing 10% better or 20% mm -hmm. better. We're talking about doing up to 500% better. Now, again, keeping in mind, that's not, that's not a permanent, increase because flow happens in short period periods of time mm -hmm. but when your team at a company is bursting with flow that's the type of improvement you know 250 300 400 500 percent and you can think of i mean books have been written about high performing teams who have produced something really incredible and if you if you look at the the tangible results of that product they're they're substantially higher well, you know, when I think of uh, data in, when I, in my kind of health and wellness consulting uh, for years, what, what was one thing that uh, we found with mental well being is that um, oftentimes people are at work and uh, there's a lot more presenteeism where people are physically there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they talk a lot about almost, you know, productivity wanes by 65% or something like that, where people show up. And you think they're there. So they're not going to show on your stats or anything, right? They're not going to show yeah. on the data for short-term disability or potentially even EAP claims or things like that. Because those people, they, they, they sit somewhere and um, they're showing up, they're attending meetings or those types of things, but their productivity is actually um, altered. So I would think that flow would be a really kind of um, a great solution for that because if people are in flow, um, you, one would assume that, you know, they'd be able to kind of recognize when they're dipping out of uh, being present and then in turn less productive. Absolutely. And I think probably the metric that keeps both of us up at night is the Gallup survey that's done year over year measuring uh, people's engagement. Mm -hmm. And that number hasn't changed much uh, over the last 20 years. And the number of people who are actively engaged at companies is in the order of 15 to 20% to your point. Mm -hmm. And I think any of us, if any of us think back to when we were doing something, even if it's outside of work, but if you can think about a time where you were so absorbed, you lost complete track of time, your sense of worry fell away. You know yourself how you were performing as compared to when you're kind of struggling with that present presenteeism. It's a fundamental difference. Right. Because I often say I'm kind of a, you know, for time, let's just use one variable, which is time. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not a super, super early person and I'm not a super, super late person. So I often say I'm kind of optimally, the time period for me is kind of like 11 to one. That okay. seems to be when I'm ultimately seem to get a lot done. Yeah. Um, and past that, I'm kind of, you know, I'm doing things, but I, I know I'm not, at, uh, like you said, you know, at, at optimal productivity. And prior to that, I get stuff done, but again, not, not as much. <laughs> but in that, that gap seems to be just from kind of noticing what's good for me. Well, and then you'll notice sometimes, so those, that's kind of your creative window. 
and uh, sometimes it'll be 11 o'clock and you'll start doing something and the next time you look at look at the clock it's one o'clock and you didn't right. even notice the two hours disappear right? right that's that's probably the that's the most universally quoted characteristic is I lost complete track of time and we all I mean I, you know when I think about that or if I'm when I'm writing or creating that's that's the time that I want to be in but yeah you know it's fleeting from our, yeah. at, at sometimes I'm like <clears> oh Yesterday I felt so good and everything came out. And then today I'm like, oh, I just have to redo that 10 times and it's yeah. still not good. Yeah. So, that's, so let's talk about some of the things that people can actually do, right? You talk a little bit about the strength finders. So I guess that would yeah. be something that people, if they really, really wanted to dig down deeper, they would have to do something like that. Yeah. But what are some things that the average mm -hmm. person could do um, to, to um, get more in flow? I think the... In, in my view, Roxanne, the fundamental building block of flow is this idea of um, an emotional high. And an emotional high is any activity that you do, whether it takes a couple of minutes or a couple of hours, but anything you do that kind of gives you that jolt of feeling good, that intrinsic satisfaction, that emotional okay. high. Mm -hmm. That's the fundamental building block. And the more data you can collect, the more you can track your emotional highs. I mean, the one piece of advice I give everyone is track your emotional highs over a period of four or five weeks. And when you're actually looking at that data, you will start to see patterns. I mean, you're already starting to, you know, see that you have a creativity window between 11 and one. Mm -hmm. When I looked at my emotional data, I find um, having ideation conversations, discussing a stimulating topic with someone who's also interested in that topic is a is an emotional high for me. Okay, okay. And so the more emotional highs you collect, the more you'll see patterns that you can both replicate and that you can scale. Mm -hmm. And so that's the one, the one healthiest activity you can do is that. I, I did have an opportunity to interview ex-NHL hockey player Patrick Sharp. And basically he said uh, the one thing he does when he watches game film is he focuses on when he scored because it makes him feel as good as he felt when he scored. And he sharp, he works at sharpening his strengths when he's feeling good from having scored. So go mm, ahead. Interesting. So is it, is it almost like a, it's an activity. So in your case, it's, it's ideas. So somebody that stimulates you in a way that gets your, your cognitive functioning, um, I'm going to say fired up. Yeah, and then and then you go, you find that that gets you into flow. In the, in uh, the hockey player's um, example, his was looking at the real. And is he is he visualizing and implanting that in himself? Yeah, it was basically <clears throat> it. So when he scored, he was in a, he was it was an emotional high when he scored, mm -hmm. and what he found is even when he watches video of having scored, that gives him an emotional high. The, the beauty of emotional highs is they're very contagious. Even if you review your own list, it starts to make you feel as good as you felt when it happened. Okay. And so okay. he's putting himself into this state mm -hmm. of feeling good, and then he works on his strengths. See, one of the biggest flow blockers is um, your inner critic, your, your inner chatter kind of telling you what you're doing wrong, criti basically criticizing you. That's a flow blocker. Mm -hmm. And so if you can work on your strengths while you're feeling good, that inner critic kind of drops away. Mm -hmm. Does that, does that clarify? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So, and I mean, you know, if anybody tells you they don't have an inner critic, I think they're telling you a little bit of a little white lie. <laughs> <laughs> it depends but you'll on how, notice... it's how, how loud it gets or sometimes it wanes. Sometimes you're like, Oh, I can conquer anything. And yeah. other times it's like, it's like a bullhorn that's yeah. kind of going at you that's almost yelling at you. And I think yeah. when, you, when you, you'll notice when you're in flow, that inner critic actually drops away, that inner critic disappears. Mm -hmm. So with the inner critic, let's talk a little bit about that because, sure. you know, we, you know, the, you know, the kind of the word that gets thrown around is that 60,000 more uh, thoughts in a, in a day. And what yeah. percentage of that is how, positive versus negative and yeah. what kind of things we kind of, you know, try to, to prime ourselves. Like I, yeah. so what I try to do is I try to, do a gratitude list of, you know, things I'm grateful for the first thing in the morning. 
Um, not every morning, but sometimes I do um, a bit of meditation, like a mm -hmm. 10 minute to kind of get my, myself going in that way. Mm -hmm. um, so what are some other things that in flow that people could actually do to, to deal with that inner critic? Um, are there actual <laughs> techniques that you find help lower that, that voice versus kind of heightening it? For sure. I think the, uh, basically the work that I do is I help people uh, find their own, let's call them flow entry points. So we all okay. have entry points that put us into flow. And I can give you some general entry points, uh, things like um, if you've read the book Drive by Daniel Pink, mm -hmm. he talks mm -hmm. about intrinsic motivators like mastery, autonomy, purpose. So clarifying those three things for yourself are flow entry points. Curiosity, passion are flow entry points. If you, if you collect your emotional highs and look at the underlying patterns, like for example, a flow entry point for me, and I suspect probably for you is learning. I love learning. Yes. If I watch, uh, I only need five or 10 minutes or 15 minutes to listen to a podcast or read a chapter of a book or read an article and that stimulates my thinking. You see how I go back to stimulated thinking is something that puts mm -hmm, me into flow. Mm -hmm. So uh, to your point about gratitude, uh, you know, studies have shown that inner critic speaks at a nine to one ratio between negativity and positivity and practicing just physically writing out what you're grateful for for five or 10 minutes a day can actually shift that ratio to six to one. It actually, just by, just by writing it down. Just by writing down and actually thinking about what you're grateful for teaches your, teaches your kind of scanning the environment skill to focus mm -hmm. more on challenges you find appealing versus threats which is what the inner critic is yelling about. Right. And, you know, another thing that I kind of fell upon, and I don't know if this makes sense, you know, because with me, when I was, you know, kind of uh, shifting from corporate, going into my own business, and there's, you know, too many things to be done and not enough hours in a day. And I, yeah. I remember thinking, you know, where I thought I should be again, you know, that thought, that negative yeah. kind of, and I, I remember I had to prepare something for uh, a speaking event or something like that. And they had wanted to know some of the things that I'd done in the business. Yeah. Um, and I hadn't really sat down and done that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, over a year period. And I sat down and it took me quite a while. And I was like, oh, my goodness. I, you know, the, the things that I'd itemized, I hadn't stopped to almost kind of, um, re, you know, relish in it. Yeah. Because I was off to something else. And yeah you know, and obviously in that there was a lot of pivoting and failures and things I had to adapt and all those things, but there was a lot, a lot of accomplishments. Yeah. And that's one thing that I try to do every, at the end of every year now is not just in my business, but also in my personal life is I try to see what kind of things I've done. Yeah. To, well, and what I would, I mean, that having that list of accomplishments um, is critical <clears throat> and you, you'll hear people saying, if you haven't updated your resume in 90 days, what have you, what have you done? What have you been doing in the last 90 days? So I would recommend even on a quarterly basis as opposed okay. to yearly, but, but fundamentally, and this is, this is the more important point in, in my view is collecting your emotional highs on a daily basis on a daily basis is what'll give you that raw material. Then defining those accomplishments at the end of the year, you just need to draw from this, long list you've created because you've noticed the emotional highs as they happen. And what you'll find is that alone has a bit of a snowball effect. The more you notice, the more you start to notice. And, and when you start to notice patterns, you actually become more effective when that pattern shows up again. It's a very nice snowball effect. So I think of it as almost like a, a performance journal then. That's the word that's coming to me. Uh, I, I, you know, I journal a lot, but yeah. you're, you're, see, you're saying to be a little bit more specific then in um, to think about the periods of the day, not just time, yeah. activities. Um, do you look at it as from a sensory level too? Because my, a lot of the work that I do a lot of times with awareness, yeah. I, you know, have uh, leaders and teams look at, uh, kind of their leadership story, what are their values, you know, what, you know, I was, when I looked at my leadership story, kind of why do I do what I do talking about authenticity, which kind of speaks to my background, um, my culture, I'm a Trinidadian, kind of growing up in the Caribbean, kind of being exposed to business in a certain way and all those things. So it becomes a combination effect. So for someone that's wanting to start to, to um, script this, 
are the things I, I often say to people, look around, what are things that, you know, stimulate you and keep you grounded? You know, are there sounds or, um, you know, uh, music sometimes, right? Like, you know, when yeah. we work out. You know. <clears throat> well, and that's why I try to use, that's why I'm using the term emotional high okay. is I'm trying to be very, very general, right? Basically anything, and it can literally be anything that you get to define. The only requirement is that it made you feel good. Okay. that it gave you a bit of an emotional high. Okay. Okay. And it's as simple as that. It, it needs to be an activity though, but, but I mean, thinking, thinking is an activity, mm -hmm. but anything that you did that made you feel good is the raw material. If I have enough of that data to, to look at, I will help you find the underlying pattern so you can trigger flow. And when you trigger flow, you boost your performance. So it's just very simply. So even the things that you described about clarifying your leadership, your leadership style, your vision statement, those are all, those are all outcomes. Mm -hmm. So I'm not asking you to clarify those day by day. I'm just asking you to clarify the activities that give you an emotional high. What'll come out of that is your purpose, your vision, your style, what you're suited for. All of that'll come out of that data. So I'm looking at the last quarter mile and you're saying, okay, back up, back up, back look, up yeah. look at what preps you to get exactly. out of the gate, what to get out of the gate. And because you do it, that raw material, um, would help you if you can understand that thematically then yeah um, what you're going to do is I'm going to see you're going to start to implement those more often through your time to that's be able right. to have more of those states that's right so and that was a very good way to put it is um, flow is not necessarily about fo focusing on the finish line mm -hmm. right it's it's exactly what you said is that it's that preparation preparation is the noticing and, and as I mentioned, I haven't worked with a person yet who hasn't been surprised by some of their own emotional highs. They couldn't have predicted them. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's when you experience an emotional high, you are experiencing a small version of what could be flow. Can you give me an example of something like that, that you, somebody shared with you that um, was an emotional high that they didn't think that it was significant? <laughs> So someone was uh, swimming, swimming laps. They typically do 60, 60 laps a morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, their routine usually involves taking a bit of a break, being a little out of breath. And then one morning they were swimming and they just noticed they'd gotten into a rhythm. They didn't need to take any breaks. And it was a form of embodied meditation. They were swimming, but they weren't thinking about anything specific. And the meditative experience while they were performing physical activity was very satisfying for them. Mm. And so that state is a state that they can replicate in other activities other than swimming now that they got in touch with it. Mm. Interesting, because you, you generally think if I can't breathe, <laughs> that's probably not something I'm gonna consider a, a, a flow state, but they got to the point where they were in flow from something that they, they do every day that yeah. they hadn't thought about. I interesting, interesting. So do you suggest people yeah, do they it had for an extended period of time, like you said, for a month, you're saying that people should write? Well, I, I my view is that you should do it for at least three weeks to have a base of data. Now, quite, mm -hmm. quite frankly, I've been collecting emotional highs. I started doing this in 2008, and I've been collecting ever since. Um, but at the very least, have to have three weeks of data, only if you've collected four or five a day. Okay. And then when you've got, when you've kind of got those 30 or 40 emotional highs to look at, um, I'll, I'll be able to point out patterns that you yourself might not even notice. Okay. What about the opposite? Let me, let me be, you know, the contrarian here for a second. Sure. What, what about um, sometimes the things that push us away from focusing on the emotional highs? you know, could sometimes there may be an activity like using that example of the swimmer. That's probably thinking I yeah. got to get these laps done. My God, it's the only say 40 minutes I have in my day to get it done. And something yeah. switched in, in him or her. Um, sometimes there's things that we actually do that deplete us, but we oh, continue sure. because of habituation. Uh, you know, I always do this and I, I do this after and, 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 and we get into that. I always say depletion versus replenishment. Is my concept yeah. that I talk about. Um, yeah. Is there any in, in the flow work or the strength finders? Um, is that already kind of parsed out at the beginning when they're doing the assessment? Or the so strengths finder basically parses out that in terms of it highlights 
talents that are intrinsically satisfying to you. Okay. However, uh, when you look at uh, depletion or negative states, or you look at flow blockers, many times, let's call it, let's call the worst example of that bad flow. Let's just call okay. it bad flow for okay. sake of argument. Yeah. Um, uh, if you use, if you use the wrong talent for a particular task, your talent can actually put you into bad flow. Mm -hmm. So for example, I get very stimulated by learning or reading, reading a chapter of a book. Um, a requirement of that is no interruptions, which is a major mm -hmm. flow blocker. Right. If I'm trying to get stimulated from reading a chapter of a book and I'm continually being distracted or interrupted, my experience is going to be fundamentally different than the flow experience. Mm. So sometimes, so I do ask people to track their emotional lows as well, as okay. well, because okay. more often than not, an emotional low is still, still involving your talents, but it's helping you get in touch with, okay, I'm using the wrong talent at this moment. I need to now switch talents. Okay. That makes sense then. So it's like a fit, right? Cause sometimes I'm yeah. a reader too. And what happens is sometimes I have to not read. Um, and I'm just more curious about this is like, let's say we talk about reading, right? I yeah. love reading, but sometimes I've, I've had such a long week yeah. that I just, I think, Oh, I'll listen to this audible. And I'm like, Oh boy, I'm, I'm not getting anything out of it. So I'm I actually tired, have to, yeah. I, I have to disconnect and then yeah. I, and then I go back to it. Am I loving it again? <laughs> that's a, that's a perfect example. The exact same activity, but you were in two completely different states from the first time to the second time. Oh, okay. Okay. And at the end of the day and, and flow, your performance is strongly correlated to your state. Okay. If you look at the work, work that you do as well. And so medicine and psychology, 150 years of research in medicine of psychology have shown us that your performance is strongly correlated to your state. Now we've focused on compromised performance due to illness and injury. Mm -hmm. um, and then sports psychologists started looking at peak performance, that idea of being in the zone, but fundamentally in both cases, your mm -hmm. performance is correlated to your state. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, even flow, uh, you can't, you can't be in flow forever. It is its own depleting experience over time. Right. Right. And so it's important to understand, you know, th the other thing that I recommend for people is a, is a talent based power hour. Okay. And a power hour doesn't have to be done at the same time, can be done throughout different five or 10 minute windows during the day, but do something that puts you into flow, but only for five or 10 minutes. Hmm. And that will, that will kind of elevate your state and doesn't run the risk of depleting you because you, because you're not overdoing it. And, and the nice thing about state is I can elevate my state by stimulating my thinking by reading. And now that I'm in that state, I'll actually run faster when I go for my run. The states, right. tra the states translate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, that's that's a fascinating thing. So, it, so again, it's going internal, which is what I talk a lot about, and really getting connected, understanding, and um, pivoting as you need to to maximize on that time that you're going to to focus on whatever the biggest you know boulder is that you need to achieve that day. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And from an authenticity perspective, um, I mean, I'm sure that you can tell when someone you're working with is in the state of flow. It's a very mm -hmm. genuine, it's a very genuine state. You can tell mm -hmm. they're loving what they're doing. You can tell they're genuinely interested in helping you love what you're doing. Flow is very contagious. We pay, we pay lots of money to go watch people in a state of flow, even if we don't do the activity that they do. Right. Absolutely. And you know, I've seen it with my son. So he, he, uh, you know, started to, he was a, an athlete, he played hockey, but then he switched to golf a couple of years ago. And, you know, I could see the development. He'd had some natural talent, just, you know, but then when he made that shift and he started to go from, you know, oh, I'm okay to I'm getting better to get, and then he finally ended up going up, uh, you know, to a higher level going up to the Ontario league. And I could see him the one time, right where and he'd been working and working and then he would go and he would get badly you know plummeted by the other competitors and yeah. i could, and i of course i know i would see his body just kind of reacting and then a couple of, say 6 months later he went back to the same kind of events and it didn't matter what happened nothing affected him and i was mm. like same guy same kid 
same kind yeah. of level of events, but it's yeah. almost like it didn't matter. He, the, he was, the last shot did not matter. And it was just about the next shot. Whereas the time before yeah. it was completely, he was absorbed by what wasn't going well and yeah. you know, all those things. So I could, I could kind of, it was actually kind of fascinating to watch. Yeah, I'm sure it was. And I think the three, the three preconditions to flow is the goal. The goal is clear. You know exactly what you're trying to do. You can see success in your mind's eye. The challenge is slightly stretch. If it, pushes you just a little bit and you have immediate feedback you know exactly how you're doing as you're doing it so gol golf is a perfect example of clear goal stretch challenge immediate feedback mm -hmm. and it always has to be as you mentioned it always has to be on the the hole you're shooting for not the one you just shot not the one you're going to shoot right. after the hole you're shooting for is what puts you into flow and that's the shift that you saw is he was mm -hmm. focusing on the hole he was shooting for Absolutely. And, and it's funny because his body language would tell, I, I could be a, a hole away and I could tell when it was earlier, what kind of hole he was having. And then after yeah. that, I couldn't tell. I was like, was that a bad hole? Or was that a good hole? Because his, 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 his uh, you know, his nonverbals and even his swing, I couldn't tell after a while, even if it was a really, and his dad would say, oh, that was a horrible hole. And I go, oh, I couldn't tell. Yeah. You know, um, so you have done some re some research um, on yep. flow. So tell us a little bit about that because I'm always, you know, the original thinkers and people that are adding to things like this, I'm always fascinated about. So tell me a little bit about the research that you've done. So uh, it was fascinating research. Uh, did it last year. It went over five weeks. Uh, if you were a participant, I would basically send you a set of questions on a Monday and then a set of questions on a Friday. So twice a week, and I did that for five weeks in a row, I had... 81 pieces of data for, for each participant. So I had over 4,000 pieces of data in my, uh, in my study. And one of the things that I discovered, one of the questions that I asked people are, was, what's your hobby? In other words, what do, you, what do you love to do, whether you're paid for it or not? Okay. And, and the participants had done StrengthsFinder, so I knew what their talents were. And then I asked them to rate the presence of their talent in their hobby and 90 percent of the participants said there was a strong presence of at least three of their five talents okay from a coaching perspective this was fascinating because if i know you like karaoke roxanne if that's all i know about you i probably can't really translate that knowledge into any kind of coaching for how you for you to become more effective at work mm -hmm. But if I know what, let's say you have the talent called Wu, which is winning others over, creating instant rapport, mm -hmm. meeting strangers, making people feel comfortable right away. If I know that and you feel Wu is strongly present when you're doing karaoke, now that we know what Wu looks like in you, I can translate that to your work. Mm. And so it's this idea, uh, if you know what your talents look like at play, Mm -hmm. That can be used as a metaphor for applying your talents at work. What amazing um, information to take back to the workplace, right? Because oftentimes we think of play, you know, uh, you know, we look at children and you look at them and they're so natural. And, you know, and what, as we get older, what do we do? That's the first yeah. thing that goes is play. Yeah. But to, to look at it from the perspective of a hobby and then to learn about the person, because I, I would think that that's fascinating, bringing that back into organizations and into teams. Well, from a coaching perspective, again, if, if, um, if we've had this conversation, I know your hobby, I know your five talents, I can just basic, and we're, and we're struggling with a challenge at work. I can ask you to just start, start describing, okay, you have input, what is, and you're a drummer, mm -hmm. what do you, how, what does input look like when you're drumming? And they start describing it and they get very animated as they describe mm -hmm. it. And typically if it's a drummer and he's describing input, he'll say, okay, he's paying attention to the percussion. He's paying attention to his own playing. He's mm -hmm. paying attention to everyone else. Are they in sync? Mm -hmm. He's paying attention to is the song being produced holistically. So he's paying attention to five different things right. in parallel. Right. And if any one of those things are, is slightly out of sync, it's usually the drummer that gets it back into sync. Mm -hmm. So just, just his description of input that way, did you hear all that information and how I could mm -hmm. translate that to work? Right? right. Paying attention to five different channels at a time, detecting when one's slightly out of sync, finding a way to bring it back into sync almost mm -hmm. nonchalantly. 
that's a very powerful strength to have at work. Absolutely. And I would think that if you have a, um, a team that's in, let's say, or, or in flux or stuck, that you can equally use that as important based on the roles that they're playing in that team in reference to a project also. For sure. Right. <clears throat> For sure. You so know. here's a guy who happens to like drumming. Mm -hmm. And through that information, we've now figure out, figured out how he might be a key, com key component of getting this team that's in flux back into sync. Yeah, because he's a, he's got he's multifaceted. He's got five elements. Yeah. Versus kind of the microscopic person that could just see maybe one or two. Yeah. Um, he has like he he's almost he can get that aerial shot. Yeah. Because of his talents to be able to bring that to the team. And and you see what you just described is is what a drummer does, and what you just described is someone at work who can get a team on track. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so that research was fascinating to me, only from the perspective of. Before that research, if I knew your hobby, I still didn't know how to coach you. Now I do. Right. So this, did you put, is there a book that, that you put this into or a research paper, a white paper somewhere out there? There is a, there's a, a summary of capstone findings. Okay. And so, which I'm glad to send to anyone who's interested. My, okay. uh, my email is omer at peakperformance.engineering. Okay. And I also have uh, a tool that'll help you collect your own emotional high data, um, totally free. And then I have a tool that's an icebreaker that'll help you just get in touch with what puts you into flow. So if you're interested in the research, if you wanna start collecting emotional highs, please send me an email. I'm glad to send you any of this information. Well, it's all fascinating. I've learned some stuff from a different perspective um, and uh, recognizing that I have to find a little, spend a bit more time um, in understanding my flow, because I know, I know, I ha I know my points. Yeah. Um, and, but sometimes I think I don't accentuate it as much as you're, you're suggesting, which would be a really, really um, such a benefit to be able to do that. Now tell everyone, I'm sure people are fascinating about learning a lot more about this, uh, where they can reach you um, and uh, you know, that they might want to reach out and uh, potentially, uh, you know, use you in training or, or coaching. Absolutely. So I think the easiest way to get a hold of me is omer at peakperformance.engineering. That's okay. my email. And if you just want any of the tools, just mention that. I'll send them back to you. If you want to connect, have a quick conversation, omer at peakperformance.engineering. Hello, Omer. Thanks so much. So what am I walking away with today? I think um, to recognize that we all have um, activities or things, or I'm going to think about my hobbies now right? Uh, the things that I do that's fun and um, what's happening to me, you know, I think I've, I've not done, ever done the strengths finders, but to really um, maybe potentially do that and look at how my hobbies help me understand what, uh, what strengths I'm bringing, uh, you know, to all, all of the people, whether it's at work or at home um, and how, how those strengths could be used. So for everyone, I uh, hope you got uh, uh, some, your sense of thinking about those um, emotional high points that uh, Omer has talked about and to focus some time and, and learn a bit more about yourself. Uh, if you're needing any more information on uh, mental health and wellness, you can reach me at roxanderhodge.com. Thanks for tuning in to Authentic Living with Roxanne, creating the space for positive, healthy change. Roxanne is a keynote speaker, psychotherapist, and coach. To work with Roxanne, visit roxanderhaj.com slash blueprint. We'll see you next time on Authentic Living with Roxanne.